Good evening, everyone. You probably have heard the same advice, you know, wherever we catch ourselves saying, I have to, we can just substitute the phrase, I get to. <laughs> this is a perfect time for that switch, you know, because some of us, like for myself, as an example, you know, I have to be here to lead the loving kindness on Friday night. But that's not a helpful attitude. I get to be here to do this practice together. You see how it really changes things. So I'm really grateful I'm not here alone. And uh, just a minor miracle that there are those of us who have the time and good fortune to gather like this and to do our best to keep in mind, keep in heart, the, these attitudes, wholesome, generous, radiant attitudes of love, of kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. And uh, I was writing up today the uh, practice theme for the Sutta study group. So I think there's probably close to 100 people who were in the three Sutta study groups at Common Ground Meditation Center. And uh, they meet the first Saturday of the month. So we're meeting tomorrow morning. So I wrote up the discussion theme for next month. So they have the month to practice with it. And I uh, just shared this teaching that's been around for a long time. Uh, Ram Das, some of you know, was really instrumental in bringing some of the teachings from the East here to the West, starting back in the 60s. He was originally, um, as a young adult, a Harvard psychology professor, along with uh, um, Timothy Leary doing experiments on LSD and other hallucinogens. And then, uh, I don't know if they got fired, but somehow they left Harvard and uh, and Ram Das went to India and studied with some of the sort of wise folks in India in the late 60s, um, including his teacher Neem Karoli Baba, pretty well known spiritual teacher around that time in India. And uh, he eventually had to come back to the States and it was hard for him to leave his teacher who he had felt a really deep connection with. And Neem Karoli Baba had this great simple takeaway teaching for Ram Das. Ram Das was originally Richard Alpert, but he changed his, uh, I think that's the name that his teacher gave him, Ram Das, sort of servant of the divine is what the basic translation of that is. And um, Neem Karoli Baba's teaching to Ram Das before he came back to the United States was, don't throw anyone out of your heart. That's just such a useful practice instruction because, you know, in little and big ways, we're throwing people out of our heart or other beings or even inanimate objects out of our heart all the time. You know, and a lot of it is unconscious. There's certain symbols or certain attributes that we see or sense in somebody or in something. And it's like, not okay. And we, we have sort of just justified or rationalized aversion and hatred. Maybe it's quite mild, mild enough not even to stand out, but it's not a friendly way of being in that moment. It's a disconnected way, you know, or a dualistic way, sort of what's allowed in, what's on the inside, the good side, and what's on the bad side. So in our meditation this evening, we're going to explore using the laboratory of our own heart here, right? Our own body, our own heart, this felt sense that just comes with being a living being. And of course, as we're sitting for about 40 minutes or so, we'll have lots of thought, a lot of emotion, 
a lot of sensation, hearing sounds, seeing sights. There will be a whole world of experience. And our practice will be like, initially it's just the faith or confidence that I can have a friendly relationship with everything that shows up internally or externally in my experience for this period of time. And even if I notice that I'm having an unfriendly relationship with a memory or pain in the knee or whatever it might be, can I have a friendly relationship to recognizing that the mind is being unfriendly? Right? So we're never out of the game or we're never sort of away from the practice. It's like, well, can I include that too? Because for, by friendly, we just mean we're willing, the heart's willing to include the experience. Not, we're sort of abandoning the work of fear and aversion where we're separating ourselves from some sensation, a memory, a feeling we're having, some mental content. And when we catch that we are in an unfriendly relationship, just see, just be curious. Can I have a friendly relationship with being unfriendly? Can I care about that? Oh, I'm being unfriendly and I care about that. I'm gonna include the fact that I'm being unfriendly. I'm gonna be curious about it. I'm gonna hold it in a generous way, not that I like being unfriendly or aversive or whatever it is that you're catching yourselves, you know, caught up in. It's not that we like it. It's just that it happens to be the way it is. And then the, and the thing we're exploring, well, maybe, maybe the appropriate way is to be friendly, even when my mind is acting out. So when that person was unmuted and there was some sound coming in, did you relate in a friendly way? And if you didn't, if you got irritated, did you relate to the irritation in a friendly way? So we're not gonna worry so much about catching ourselves being unfriendly. We're gonna see them as opportunities to be curious about being friendly with an unfriendly heart and mind, okay? And the last thing I want to say about the guided meditation, it really doesn't matter what shows up for each of us in terms of our mental content, emotional content, in terms of sensation or the sounds in the room where you are. Because we're exploring like, you know, we're not, we're not like interested in loving kindness practice that's just good when we're around cute puppies or, you know, I was, uh, I spent a couple of days up in Northern Minnesota and uh, real, real close to the boundary waters. And uh, when my partner had a, has an artist residency, she's still up there for a few more days. And it's so, so beautiful. And the lake was just perfect. And then there were the biting flies. <laughs> so it's just sort of interesting, like uh, it just seems so appropriate to not like them and to kind of feel quite entrenched in the not liking, like how dare they ruin the mosquitoes and the biting flies? How dare they ruin this perfect place? And it's just, you know, it's, but my having an unfriendly relationship with the flies doesn't help the flies and it doesn't help me and it doesn't make them stop biting me. It's just this tightness. It's just an unnecessary suffering. It's not a generous way to be. It's not a wise or even functional way to be. So in our own little laboratory of our 40 minute sit or whatever, we just, we can explore with an open mind, is friendliness functional in all times, in all ways, in all circumstances. So just in the little relatively simple laboratory of our 
40 minutes sit, we can just explore. And then can we keep the friendliness in mind? And as we're keeping that way of being, that way of relating that we're calling friendliness or metta, loving kindness, as we're keeping in mind, can we feel how it has a source? Like I personally don't have to generate that kindness. There's an upwelling that's just part of what it is to be aware, to be present. So you see if you can notice how the upwelling of that friendliness is there and it's not running out, it doesn't run out. And then the more we get interested in that quality of upwelling, it keeps showing up, then really sense it as a kind of radiance uh, generosity in all directions. It isn't even about the particular thing you're being friendly with, because that friendliness, that love goes out in all directions. And then the last step is just learning to abide. So instead of any sense of me doing the friendliness, it's more like becoming this radiant beautiful, wholesome friendliness. So it, it feels very effortless in that, let's call it the final stage or the final blooming of the capacity to be friendly. Okay, so take a little bit of time, adjust your posture so you'll be comfortable sitting for about 40 minutes, whatever you need to do. And in a kind and generous way, you might want to take some satisfying breaths in and out. It's not so much we're imposing this deep breathing on the body, but we're just inviting the body itself to take some satisfying in and out breaths in a way that's actually feels good or it's actually satisfying for the body. And of course, we have all the time we need to take a couple of these longer, satisfying breaths in and out in a way that feels good in the body. It's a gift in a way to the body to let it breathe in a way that feels good. And so the mind is simply aware of what it feels like to be breathing in a satisfying way. So maybe one more of these longer, deeper, satisfying breaths in and out. And eventually just trusting the body to continue breathing in a easy, natural way that doesn't require any mental oversight at all. And we can begin our metta, our loving kindness, friendliness practice by just being grateful of the bodily, the bodily intelligence. Grateful to be able to sit here In a very real way, the body is the expression of so much natural intelligence. The continuation of this process of evolution and so much millions of years of learning of evolutionary learning Just appreciating this particular expression of nature that is the body in the same way we would really appreciate the beauty of a big old tree or a beautiful bed of moss or wild animal. Just appreciate the 
feeling of the skin, the structure of the skeleton, the amazing pumping heart, the lungs, the fire of the digestion, digestion system, the electrical nervous system that can sense so much, eyes that see, nose that smells, Then you can, if it feels right, you can just offer a simple phrase of love to the body or kindness. I care about this amazing, resilient body. Care enough to be close and willing to feel what's here to feel. And I care enough to just in a simple way offer good wishes to this living body. May this body be healthy and at ease in this life. May this body be healthy and at ease. And perhaps feeling the simple kindness, friendliness welling up, that authentic movement of kindness toward the body, toward the moment, toward the chair or the floor you're sitting on, and the space around you care about this life, appreciate the room, I appreciate all my dear ones, my friends and family, Let's see who comes to mind. care enough to allow this heart to be touched, care enough to send out this friendly, benevolent wish. May all beings, my friends, acquaintances, all beings, even the challenging, difficult ones. May all beings be at ease in their lives. May all beings live their lives with ease. And using memories or mental images, using phrases or reflections until this quality of welling up, this generosity of the heart is very clear. And then let that be the object of your meditation, that welling up of friendliness, or you could call it the inclusivity of friendliness, the heart that says, yes, this too, this also belongs here and now. The heart has room for this too, this person, this situation, this thing, yes. Until we can feel this radiance going out everywhere in every way, this boundless generosity of friendliness. And then learning to abide 
rest, trust, and ultimately be this love, this generous and spacious and undying love. So I'll let you practice in silence now for a while, and then I'll review the instructions in about 15 minutes.
Just remembering the pieces of our reflection. When you need to, just take the time to arouse the friendliness, bring to mind a mental image, a memory, use a phrase, until once again you feel that this heart right here, right now, is capable of loving, of being friendly and kind. And once it's aroused, then notice the generous quality of that attitude. A welling up, a giving away of the kindness. And notice it has a boundless, radiant quality, more and more inclusive. So it isn't dependent on whatever we use to arouse the kindness, it's willing to go out everywhere and every way. And the last part is to learn to rest in that love, to trust it, to abide, and in a sense to become the kindness and friendliness itself. This boundless, love that says yes, yes, yes to everything that comes and goes. The Buddha describes this state of abiding in metta, loving kindness, as a liberation of the heart. Because 
in these moments, the heart is liberated from the constricting effects of fear and aversion. So you can actually notice the absence of fear and aversion now. And notice that that absence of fear and aversion is this radiant and generous, beautiful heart. It's really a gift all around to oneself and to all. And the Buddha offered these words as a way of practicing, I will abide pervading all quarters with this heart imbued with love, friendliness above, below, all around, everywhere and every way, I will abide pervading this all encompassing world with friendliness, generous, abundant, boundless, free from all fear and aversion. I will abide. And remember, even if there are places where the heart says no, we throw somebody out of our heart or some situation is too much, too painful. That's okay. That's natural. That happens. So can we be friendly when that happens? when our heart closes or reacts with aversion. Oh, honey, I care about that too. I care about this aversion. And metta love knows how to include that too. Sometimes it's like this. And I care. You belong too. This heart of metta is liberating precisely because it knows how to meet every and all moments. In this way, metta, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity, such a functional way to be relating. It really works.
a heart that's willing to connect, willing to be present, a heart that doesn't need the moment to be different than it is. This is what the Brahma Viharas, these divine abodes, this is what they allow for. this generous and inclusive presence. Just take another three or four minutes in silence. So take a little time and adjust so that you'll be comfortable. Stretch a little if you need. And yes, I did. I noticed some people wrote in the chat. Thanks for the reminder. But I just repeated the instructions that I said while I was muted. So if you didn't miss anything. Yeah, so um, 
I think it'd be nice for us to chat together. And I'll just review this theme. And uh, some of you I know have read some of the suttas, but there's really several um, places in the discourses in early Buddhism where the Buddha mostly talking about the monks, but also the nuns and lay people to lesser degree, just these ordinary situations of reciprocity where people are just appreciating being together, working together, taking care of each other in very natural ways as milk, uh, what is it like milk and water, how well they mix together, living in harmony. And um, yeah, it's, it'd be interesting to just reflect together about well, what's actually in the way of living in harmony with each other? What ideas? And, you know, like, for example, one of the ideas that can feel in the way is we'll all get taken advantage of. If I'm friendly in a world that's like this, then I'm going to be taken advantage of and I'll be left with nothing, something like that. Um, but, but having an attitude of friendliness, which remember you can use the, um, opposite. So it's like the attitude that is free of fear and aversion that I can actually take care of myself, take care of my responsibilities. Do we need fear and aversion? Do we need that tightness? to take care of business as a human being, to live a good life, to be skillful. And, and then the other thing that people might want to share is like, how, how does it work for you to keep friendliness in mind? What actually works for you in terms of keeping it in mind? And that, that way of going from you know, that more uh, specific involvement where I'm arousing, I'm generating, I'm bringing, I'm sort of using my memory, I'm using my ideas to provoke in a way, to remember, oh yeah, this heart is capable of love. Because I just remembered myself because I was away for a few days and I came home our cat who spends most of its time outside, especially in the summer, you know, he came home and wanted to spend some quality time with me, you know, so we had our moments and it, it's nice. He does this thing where his paws kind of go like this when he's happy. And it's a really nice little moment of reciprocity. My presence seems to make him happy, his pr presence, seems to make me happy, right? And there's that very natural um, movement of love and friendliness. It's, it's very natural. So I might use an image, a memory of that. And then I realize, oh, in this very real, very ordinary way, this heart can be really generous and loving, uncontrived. I'm not, I had to do the work of remembering, but once I remember, then the love is aroused, it's there. And then I pay attention to that actual movement, that upwelling, because we want to sense that it's like that movement isn't, it's like there for the taking, <laughs> you know, it's not like I got to keep digging for the love. Once it's aroused, we notice that it is an upwelling. Now, if I take my attention away, uh, away from that, and I remember all the things I resent in life, then that fountain, that upwelling is going to get cut off. Not because it went away, but because I took the attention away from it. I forgot it. And I, instead I was remembering what that person said to me and how that wasn't fair. And then I'm back in an aversive state. So we, we learned to arouse it, notice the upwelling, that generosity of the heart, noticing that it's boundless, like it can go everywhere and every way. 
boundlessly, generously, and then resting in that boundless radiance, the kind of effortless being the love. That would be good to share too. Like, does your experience line up with that way of mapping out the practice of metta or loving kindness? If we're noticing one of those parts, we, we are, we're also noticing that it feels good. That really, that creates the feedback. So it makes it a little bit easier to do the work of remembering or starting over because it feels good. But it isn't the habit. The habit is we like the drama and often the drama involves aversion and fear, you know, or excitement. But this is a different thing to keep in mind. It's not the usual kind of drama that we're really good at keeping in mind. So it definitely, we're definitely rewiring. And the, and the real work is, like you suggested, it's keeping it in mind. And the key is if we can't keep the more subtle expressions of love in mind, like a boundless, generous being love, then we have to go to more gross aspect of the practice. Well, let me remember my cat or let me remember washing my dog. And let me remember what my heart felt like when I was seeing my dog and seeing that it was happy. And how was I feeling? Oh, there's that upwelling. Okay, can I keep that in mind? So use the phrase or the mental image, keep it there as long as you need it there. But when the actual visceral or, or movement in the heart is clear enough, then see if we can just keep that in mind. Even if we use a phrase or a mental image, let that go into the background a little bit so that we're training the mind to keep this relatively subtle thing in the foreground. Because it a, it's a whole training. The mind isn't used to keeping this in mind, right? Yeah, and, and that's one way, I think, like, if you really want to take this up about just the theme tomorrow, the rest of the evening, the rest of your life of just friendliness all around, you can think of it, you play with it both ways, like, can I be friendly with this? How about this? Can I be friendly with this? Another way is, like, what would it be like to be free of fear and aversion? So non-aversion with this because in a way that's a more practical or grounded way because like Chelsea's example is such a good example of the wisdom in the mind deciding I'm just too tired to pick up the aversion I'm just not going to be averse to, the, to this anymore like that's a possibility to not be averse to this because that's really what metta loving kindness is is the absence of aversion. We often think of it as like, okay, I've got to contrive or be this friendly, generous, kind person. But it's really letting, realizing what a dead weight fear and aversion is and letting it fall away. And that can be a more practical way to remember what metta is than using the positive, like kindness as a, an attitude or friendliness as an attitude. Yeah, other thoughts that come to mind? Yeah, because they don't exist, to, they can't exist in the same heart, aversion and kindness. And you can just see like when, you're, when you feel pretty grounded in friendliness and metta, then you can go the mind, you can invite the mind to go to those places where you have a lot of fear and aversion. And you'll notice it's, it's a different, you, the take is different. And that's why it's such a powerful antidote, like when we are caught in fear and aversion and hate, to not so much to think, okay, how can I love this person? 
but go anywhere where you, the mind gets established in kindness, you know, whatever you have to turn toward, because it will, it will extinguish the being rooted in the fear, the hate, the aversion. If we find something, you know, you read some news and it triggers this kind of rageful, hateful, you know, attitude about somebody. And, and because you've been sort of dwelling on that particular place of self-righteousness for a while, it's like a deep groove. It's really important to break those cycles or if there's some painful breakup or whatever in your past that your mind tends to dwell on, then instead of being in that place where you're, the mind is planting seeds for more hate, more aversion, you know, we can turn towards something where we can have a friendly relationship. And then it forces the mind to drop the activity that's not helpful to be dwelling in. It doesn't heal it, but at least we're not adding, deepening the groove, you know, spinning one more lap, two more laps, three more laps with the same kind of unhelpful attitude. Any reflections on that movement from how the, the particular skill set to arouse kindness, to notice the generosity, the upwelling of kindness, the sort of boundless radiant, like, uh, yeah, just it goes everywhere to the skill set to rest and abide and trust. It's like, in a way, I mean, I like this. This is partly in the tradition, but partly articulated by uh, this German monk, one of my teachers, Venerable Analio. Um, and uh, I just find that useful. Like, oh yeah, I actually need four sets of skills, how to arouse it. Arousing it just means when I'm not particularly friendly or kind, what can I bring to mind that reminds me right here and now, oh yeah, this heart is capable of experiencing kindness and friendliness. How can I notice that generous, it's kind of an energetic generosity of kindness. How can I see that it's boundless? It goes everywhere. It's not dependent on a particular relationship, even though I might've used a particular relationship to arouse it. And I can actually, uh, in a meditative way, totally trust it, like uh, absorb into it in a sense, be that love by keeping it in mind so fully that everything else the mind isn't paying attention to. So that's the becoming or the merging is by being so interested in to do that. We really have to, the mind or wisdom has to realize um, the healing, the ple pleasurable healing of that state of mind or attitude of mind. It feels good, right? And that's what allows uh, the heart to merge with it is like, oh, I totally trust this. It feels good. It is good. I can put everything else down now and just be this love. Yeah. And if we, if the mind got fixed on, I have to do this, I have to do that. Then I have to make this call. Then I have to meet that. That, that might feel like a real burden in the heart. But if the heart is seeing all of those tasks, not as the task, but as an abiding in that generous, friendly, kindly way, then the task just flows out of that. Because what it's really about is meeting the moment with kindness. And then this activity flows out of that, then meeting the next moment in kindness and because this is a thing about life, whether you're raising kids or college professor or whatever it might be. If the attention is more on the wholesomeness of how the mind is relating to whatever's next in our life, like even right now, we're working in a sense, this could be work for us, like, oh God, I'm here with a group of people, 
you know, trying to not make a fool of myself or whatever. Or it could be just uh, an effortless love fest, whether we're speaking or not speaking. And it's really just a question of like the meaning our mind is projecting onto the moment. And so one thing to explore, like Kelly was talking about, is, and just start with places in your life that are relatively easy. Just instead of projecting, oh, this is a lot of work dealing with this person in my life or this situation in my life. Just like, I don't know what I'm going to do or what I'm going to say. I'm just going to be friendly and I'll let everything else happen on its own. I'm just going to be in this generous, friendly, open place and see what comes out of me and the moment. And we might find that life knows how to take care of life <laughs> in a funny way. That's the image, some of you know this, but that's the image that's used in early Buddhism about metta, that it naturally knows how to meet the moment. And they give the example of pouring water in different size vessels and how water immediately feel, fills that vessel, that vase or whatever, perfectly. You know, it doesn't have to like, figure out, okay, how am I going to get myself into that jar or into that, you know, thing? It just knows how to fill it to meet the moment. Thanks, Kelly. Robert, did you want to say something? Yes. <clears throat> I think this is a, a very um, beneficial discussion for me in particular. I think um, there are many situations that drive me up the wall, but the one that doesn't is when I'm driving. And perhaps that's because I've had a lot of experience driving and working in, in New York and in the traffic department. And so when I'm driving, I am trying to be very, very conscious of pedestrians. There's not as many lights in the streets here as there are in New York. Most every street corner has a light in New York, they're not stop signs. And um, so if I'm a block away and I see someone ready to cross the street, especially it can be one person, someone walking their dog or a dad with his kid going on a bicycle, all these things, I will stop a block away and I'll do that to make sure that not only have I stopped, no one can go beyond me, but I'm also looking at the traffic coming toward me so that the stop is a good stop and that that person, those people can get across the street without panicking in the middle of the street because vehicles are coming. And it's, it's um, maybe it's like you and the cat. It's, it's a go-to for me. It's very simple, it's easy. I do it all the time, as often as I can. And it brings me a lot of joy. And of course, people get across the street, they're waving and they're happy as well. That's, that's one example, I think, where I, I think meta in particular works well for me. Yeah, and, and the thing about your example that I bet a lot of us is just the truth that it brings you joy. And that, that's the real ticket as we explore being friendly uh, in life is to realize it really feels good. I mean, it's, it's totally... I mean, it's just as, I don't, can't think of a better word than crazy that we haven't been as interested in this practice as we should be because it feels so right. It's so functional and it's pleasurable. And I don't know if, if this is true for some of you, but <clears throat> like even tonight, but when I do metta practice or any of the flavors of the Brahma Viharas, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity, I, it's sort of like the, that upwelling of love meets the armored heart, energetic tightness, right? And there's a little <clears throat> conflict. I don't know if you know, just, just in a visceral sense, like part of the heart wants to open and then there's the habit of being tight, being fearful, being, you know, set, like in that defensive stance in the world. And uh, so in a way, 
it feels good, but it always reveals how I'm holding energetically the habits of holding. And it takes a while before the habits of holding the armoring realizes, oh, maybe I don't have to be so tight, so armored, so heavy, right? And opens up. And this is the thing is when we're tight, every situation seems like we should be tight. And when we're open with kindness, every situation seems appropriate for kindness. So it's self-fulfilling in that way. You know, if we walk around the world afraid and irritated and aversive, then everything looks like we should be relating that way because it, it affects perception. The tightness affects perception. Just like when, when our heart is radiant and loving and open, every situation in life seems perfect for more love, more kindness. It's contagious in that way. We're really nice to be together. There are a couple of announcements. Um, let's see. Uh, there will be a couple of things coming up. Ajahn Chandako, um, who grew up in Minnesota, um, but has been a Buddhist monk now for about 25 years. And he's the abbot of a monastery uh, near um, Auckland in New Zealand. But he visits Minnesota every year or two, and he'll be in town. And he's going to give a talk on Wednesday, the 14th at 6 p.m. And we'll have it both in person and we'll do a Zoom with that or a live stream, I'm not sure. And we're also going to be offering him a meal at uh, 1030 or 1045 that morning. That's a traditional things that lay people do because monks can't feed themselves. They have to get fed or food has to be offered every day. So we basically offer him the meal and then all of us there just have a potluck and we sit down and then there's usually a good Dharma conversation. So that's 1045 to maybe about noon or a little bit later, depending on the conversation. Everyone's welcome to come to that potluck at 1045 or come to the talk or both come to the talk at six to 730. And uh, when Fricky and I will be teaching the next intro class begins on Tuesday, the 12th of July. There's a half day retreat on the 10th. And on the 24th, we're having a day long retreat at Prairie Farm Common Grounds Retreat Property. And we'll also have an online version if you don't want to get out there uh, and register because we'll try to organize carpools so people can drive out together. It's a nice way to get to know people in the community. And it's something like, I forget if it's 9.30 to 4.30 or something like that. So you don't have to get up too early. You would mean leaving town around eight. It's about an hour and 20 minutes to get to the place. So all that are on our calendar. And uh, yeah, so nice to be together tonight. I'm so happy that you joined in and wishing everybody a really nice holiday weekend. Take care. <laughs>